Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Judith Butler's text, What is Critique, which is a good follow-up to the one I did last week on Michel Foucault's What is Critique. Now in this episode I'm going to do more than just talk about Judith Butler's text here, because there are quite a few issues with this text. These issues are born out of mistranslations of Foucault's original text, What is Critique, and they really hinder Butler's understanding of the text. So her version here is drawing from an edited volume called The Politics of Truth, in which the translation of what is critique is found, and that, that's the one that Butler uses, but it has some issues with the translation. Now, in this text, where there aren't issues with the translation, Butler actually just misquotes what this edited volume writes. Now, last week when I did the episode on what is critique with Foucault, I wasn't reading the original French, much to my chagrin. I should have been reading that text in the original French, but I happened to be reading it from another edited volume from a book called What is Enlightenment? Now, if you wanted to go read this text, that translation is much better. So as I was reading the Foucault for this week, sorry, as I was reading the Butler for this week, I was reading it and I was struggling to understand because I just felt like I was contradicting myself or I was misunderstanding what she was saying because of what I had read the week before. So lo and behold I went back and then I dug up the original and found out that some of the quotes that she was using from Foucault were just wrong. And these aren't minor issues, they're pretty significant mistranslations and misreadings of Foucault. And so in this episode I'm going to present them and really emphasize why we should be reading texts in their original language, even though I didn't even do that last week, but this will really illustrate why that's important. But before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy, or on Twitter at David Guigno. If you're new here, welcome, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, go check out my channel where there's like more than 200 episodes, I believe. And if you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form where there shouldn't be any ads. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video on YouTube if you're into that at all. So if you want to help me out, you know, like, share, subscribe, do all those things. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, let's jump into this text. What is critique? Now she starts it out by asking a pretty important question. And that is, what is the role of critique? Or more precisely, how can we actually characterize what critique is? if it is only understood in relation to the things that it's critiquing. So if it is only taking form in how it is being deployed, then it is not going to have a kind of generalized form. And Butler says that if we abstracted from its specific manifestations to try to come up with a generalized form of critique, all we're going to be left with is a philosophy. And that's not very helpful to understanding what critique is. So we are confronted with a very interesting problem as soon as we pose this question, what is critique? Just because it doesn't have a very concrete or edifying base that will give it uh, an identity, that will give it a shape. Instead, it is going to always be mutating and forming in relation to the various things that it is criticizing, various ideas that it is criticizing. Now this essay, Butler's essay here, was delivered at a conference on Raymond Williams, which doesn't make much sense because she only mentions Raymond Williams for like five seconds, and then he goes away. It feels like she just shoehorned him in uh, just to have this essay about Foucault, really. But then she goes on to say that this idea of critique was also brought up by someone like Raymond Williams. And Raymond Williams was very clear that the operations of critique is not about finding fault. It's not about pointing to empirical falsity or issues in somebody's argument. Critique serves another function. And critique for way Raymond Williams is a way by which to engage in a kind of cultural dialogue, a kind of cultural uh, engagement with something to point to the various historical social manifestations that might have conditioned it, that gave possibility to a thing. And critique is about really revealing those histories. So for example, one of the key terms in Raymond Williams' corpus is this idea of mobile privatization, where he found that the advent of televisions in homes demonstrated what he called mobile privatization because people were private in their homes. And this was following industrialization when somewhat affluent people, mostly white people, were running out to the suburbs to find their own little plot of land. They wanted to have a connection to 
the outside world. They wanted to have a connection to urban life, to everything else going on. So then televisions entered the picture in a more meaningful way because they'd already existed. They became private things that people could sit at home in their private lives and be sort of symbolically transmitted somewhere else to be mobile while also being private. So he mobilizes an idea about critique in order to understand all these historical and social developments. Now, likewise, she draws upon the work of Theodore Adorno, who is also very, who is a very prominent figure in this question of critique. And one of Adorno's really prominent, I think, one of his really prominent contributions to this question is pointing to the ways that critique is not opposed to praxis, where there's, you know, practice on the one hand, praxis, uh, the art of acting upon things on the one hand, and on the other hand, there's just theoretical speculation and critique. Theodore Adorno demonstrates that you can't really have praxis without critique, without theory. And Judith Butler takes up this idea as well in other texts, where she says that, in fact, you know, theory and critique is itself a kind of practice. You can't actually engage or mobilize a population in terms of acting against injustice without having a bedrock of critique that motivates it, or that, uh, in part, um, motivates the thinking about the issues. Then she turns to Foucault, and like I said, I've covered the episode on Foucault's essay last week, but what she says about Foucault here is correct, and then she says that critique is up the possibility to open up more critique. It is a way by which to open up new possibilities to the uh, act of thought, to the act of resistance and practice and praxis. And insofar as critique is going to be bound up with any kind of discursive framework within certain uh, hierarchies of power and knowledge, critique is not a neutral thing. As I said earlier, critique is always going to be understood or it's going to take its form in relation to the things that it criticizes. So there's much about an epistemic, about a socio social field that can be learned by analyzing the operations of critique itself. Against whom is critique deployed? Why is it deployed? How is it deployed? What assumptions are assumed in the operations of critique? So to think about this, she uses the work of Habermas, who thinks about things like the public, or thinks about things like discourse and democracy quite uncritically, who just imagines a thing called this public sphere without critically evaluating many of his key terms. So in his own critique, we can see that there are some things he takes to be axiomatic, like the possibility of dialogue, the possibility of neutrality, of openness, of discourse. He just takes to be uh, neutral. And we only really gather that or can understand the limits of that by interrogating his model of critique, how he's mobilizing his own critique. But how can we actually motivate or put forward any kind of critique unless we believe ourselves to be in the right? You know, how can we claim something else is wrong unless we are tacitly, maybe not so directly, claiming that there is something better, which implies that there is something more right? And this is how, and Butler is reading correctly, at least I think, into Foucault here, that it is associated with a kind of virtue, where somebody mobilizing critique, putting forward a critique, is implying that they have found virtue. They have found the proper way of being in the world, and that their critique is going to help string along others or other ideas into the light that they found of proper being. Now, this is the point where Butler goes very much wrong, and it's not entirely her fault. The translation that she's using is from a text called The Politics of Truth that I mentioned at the beginning. And right here, well, this part, it actually is her fault, she just misquotes the English translation of the text. Now, let me read what she says here. And this is what she writes of critique. She says that it is a means for a future that it will not know nor happen to be. It oversees a domain it would not want to police and is unable to regulate. Now, the operative word here is to not want to police, to not want to regulate. So she, quoting this translation from the book, The Politics of Truth, she says that critique does not want to police and it is unable, because it is unable to regulate anything. Now, the in the original French that I went and dug up, which was kind of difficult to find, this is actually what Foucault says. Uh, in the original, he goes, elle est un regard Elle is la critique. So she said, he says uh, in the original, La critique est un regard sur un domaine où elle veut bien faire la police et où elle n'est pas capable de faire la loi. 
which is to say in English, critique is a gaze, it is a look uh, upon a domain that it wants to police. Où elle veut bien faire la police? It wants to police. Et où elle n'est pas capable de faire la loi. But that it is not capable of actually exerting a certain order upon, a certain law upon. Now this is a very important moment because it demonstrates the importance of reading the original text. Because in Foucault, he's saying that wants to police these things, but it doesn't have the capacity to. Whereas in Butler, she's saying that it does not want to police these things. It does not want to impose an ordering. Now in the original text that I covered last week, Foucault is very clear that critique supplants one kind of ordering with another. So I use the example of Martin Luther and he says, in terms of the church, he says that people sought to get away from the church by returning to scripture. And he uses that as an example to say that people just took one ordering for another, from the church back to scripture. And I use the example of Martin Luther. And as Butler understands it here, it's totally the other way around. It is an issue where critique does not want to just impose another ordering. Whereas for Foucault, it very much does. And the point here that I'm trying to get across is that Foucault is demonstrating that critique is bound up within a certain epistemic paradigm that doesn't just evade power. In fact, because it is bound up within that paradigm, it is only going to reinscribe its own power. So she goes on to say that critique is fundamentally opposed to an ordering function, when in fact that is not the case in Foucault. For Foucault, it just reinscribes another ordering function, which is very important. Now, despite the issues presented here, and there are going to be more as I go through here just momentarily, she still is very much interprets this text acceptably, but not to its full capacity. I think that the conclusion that she'll come out with at the end is correct, but she sort of illustrates it as her own amazing observation of this text when it is actually found in the text itself. Because the central point, point that Foucault is making is that critique is the act of desubjectifying, which can be difficultly translated sometimes to desubjugating, which is the act of, you know, liberating oneself, which is different from desubjectifying, but I don't want to get in that, into that distinction here. The conclusion that Foucault makes, and that Butler's going to pick up on, is that in the act of critique, we desubjectify, but we only do so by resubjectifying. We tear down ordering in order to impose another ordering, and Foucault's very clear about this at the get-go. Now, Butler concludes her article by saying, and we're not at the conclusion yet, but I want to make this as clear as possible to lay out the trajectory. Butler says that it is always going to be the case that desubjectifying implies another kind of subjectivity. And she finds this, despite the fact that Foucault says that, uh, in, in her mind, Foucault says that that is not going to be the case, that um, critique is the act of just desubjectifying full stop. When in fact, he says, no, it is actually the act of resubjectifying to some extent, reordering. So that is, those are the stakes here. Anyway, she goes on to say that, and here she turns to other Foucault texts, specifically to the first two volumes of The History of Sexuality, which I've also covered on here if you want to go check those out. But she says here that in the act of being governed, people are constituted as subjects. So you become a subject in the act of being governed. And it is in that sphere of being governed that you are rendered, you know, a certain subjectivity with certain proclivities, with certain uh, approximations to power, with certain potentials but those potentials are always going to be limited and inhibited by the very governing principles that gave you your subjectivity, that gave you your individuality. And so one of the ways I like to illustrate this to make it as easy as possible is I think about a kid in a sandbox, where a kid in a sandbox is given what might appear to them unlimited potential. That is, their imagination is gonna set the limits to what they can do with the sand, provided, let's say, they had a little bit of water to be able to mold the sand to whatever they wanted. They can make villages, castles, whatever. But at the end of the day, they are still going to be bound by this structure. Now, I don't want this to be a literal uh, 
demonstration or illustration of how Foucault imagines power, there isn't a neat outside to this, all of this. There isn't a border that we can just step over, like a kid in a sandbox. I'm just using it to demonstrate that the child is going to be limited by things they might not be able to immediately recognize in what appears to be infinite potential. So drawing upon these texts, that is the History of Sexuality Volume 1 and Volume 2, she says that critique, really continuing on her own uh, train here, she says that critique it will be the act of desubjectifying this kind of subjectivity that is formed in these governing bodies or in these governing epistemes, or in any episteme, episteme, however you pronounce it. Now, as I said, that's not entirely correct for Foucault, at least not in this this text, in the text of what is critique, because he says, you know, desubjectifying is just another form of subjectifying. Now she goes further to say that in the act of being governed, one is opened up to a certain possibility of self-realization. Now this is a self-realization that doesn't just form in response to power, but it is one that finds the very possibility of realizing one's, one's own potential, one's own uh, maybe desire, one's own um, beliefs within a certain sphere, within a certain sphere of governance, and then acting upon that. So while it might not be all that successful, while you might fail, while it might reproduce the same system at large, it is nevertheless going to demonstrate the epistemic limits to that original power to show that it is not permanent. It is not universal. There are alternatives. So even though critique might not be effective at actually performing this operation to its full extent, that is the act of desubjectifying for Butler, it will nevertheless point to those limits. Now in the original Foucault, that is somewhat correct, but he says that it is demonstrating or it will demonstrate the limits of any kind of epistemic field, any kind of epistemic horizon, by actually putting another form of subjectivity in. Not just desubjectifying full scale, but putting another form of subjectivity in that highlights those limits to say that, look, other forms of subjectivity or power are possible, which therefore demonstrates that other forms of governance, other forms of kind of epistemic paradigms are therefore possible as well. Now, there's a very weird part here when she's recounting the way that Foucault writes about the church, which he obviously does in his text, and I've co I covered last week. So you want, if you want more on that, go listen to that, which you've probably already done, because why else would you be here if you didn't already listen to that one? But anyways, she thinks about this uh, or recounts Foucault's writing about the church as well. And she using, she's using the same translation from The Politics of Truth, this book, this edited volume, and both she and The Politics of Truth get it wrong because the translation that they use in that text is just, is, is way off. And she uses it, she properly quotes them, but because she's using a mistranslation, it obviously leads her analysis uh, astray. They write that critique puts forth, or is the act of putting forth universal and indefeasible rights. Whereas in the original, he says, Foucault says that critique opposes universal and indefeasible rights that are proffered up, that are implied with governance. And this governance, he says, can assume different forms, either be in the form of monarchy or in the form of a patriarch or a teacher, whatever. Critique opposes those indefeasible rights, those claims to universals. Now, Butler translate or using this quote from the politics of truth seems to contradict her whole thing so far because as the quote says that she uses, critique puts forward its own universals, its own indefeasible rights, which would be totally opposed to what she's been saying so far, that critique is actually undoing those uh, those rights, undoing those universals. But she doesn't catch on that. I don't know how she reconciles this contradiction. I couldn't, I couldn't read it in the text how she actually navigates out of that. And so I was kind of totally baffled. And in the original, indeed, the word being used here, or how it, how it is used, uh, Foucault says, um, la critique c'est donc uh, opposé des gouvernements, uh, des universels droits, whatever, something like that. Critique is the act, therefore, of opposing these rights, not of putting forth such rights or such universals. But in, in any case, this really highlights the difficulty of understanding this text. And I'm, I haven't found anything about this that is people pointing to the issues of this translation. If that exists, if someone's written on this, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, I'm going to try and write something on it. So 
don't try to plagiarize me because I have this video out and you won't be able to do that without getting caught. But anyways, uh, just if anyone knows of that critique, anyone knows if anyone else has actually uh, written on this, this issue that Butler has with reading Foucault in this text, I'd love to be linked to it, like send that to me immediately. But anyway, so she then continues to say that, and, and I think correctly, that the act of resistance and critique is an act of voluntary insubordination. It is an act of saying no, and then that demands a kind of subjectivity, which is exactly how she concludes that, oh, well, ultimately what Foucault is implying is that the subjectivity that is being desubjectified is implying another kind of subjectivity, one that tries to vie for, struggle for self-realization, struggle for their own potential. But again, my issue is not that she's incorrect about this, but that this is exactly what Foucault is saying, and she would have realized that if she hadn't mistranslated it. She would have realized that if she'd actually understood, or really taken to heart, the Hegelian notions within Foucault's own work that he demonstrates at the end of that, uh, the archaeology of knowledge, where there's that appended essay, uh, I forget what it's called, where he says that, you know, even in our opposing Hegel, we find Hegel standing there once again. Right? Even as we turn away from him, there he is once again. Now, the point there is that even in opposing power, we seem to reify it or rectify it. We seem to recapitulate it. And the same can be very well said of how Foucault is imagining subjectivity here, where in the act of desubjectifying, we are only ever re-subjectify. In the act of de-ordering, deregulating, we only end up putting up our own regulations, our own orderings, at least within this canon of critique, within this operation of critique, which he comes to somewhat oppose with the kind of what he calls the historical philosophical approach, one that is going to open the door for more possibility, uh, even if those possibilities might not actually complete the total operation of desubjectifying. But, the, you know, go check out that episode if you want more on that from last week. And yeah, that's pretty well it. You know, I'd really love to hear comments about this. I was just totally bamboozled when I was trying to read this text and I was, I, I went and checked my old episode, my episode from last week thinking that I, I got it totally wrong, but then I dug up the original. It turns out I wasn't wrong. Uh, it's just mistranslations through everything amok. Uh, but yeah, if anyone has any comments on that, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, or again, if anyone has a link, if anyone's written anything about these mistranslations and how they impact Butler's understanding of Foucault, I would love to have those um, because it's super fascinating. And yeah, anyways, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.